Welcome, friends, to the North Bay Business Journal's Impact Marin Conference. We are so happy you're joining us today on this beautiful March day, and we hope by the end of this hour and a half, you will have learned something about our business community from the assembled experts we have today. You would have to be unaware of what's going on in the world for the last year to know why we're gathered the way we are today. It's changed our lives permanently and perhaps temp uh, temporarily in many ways. Uh, this is what we do at the North Bay Business Journal. We follow three basic precepts to deliver accurate news in a timely manner for our business community, to provide data and reports that allow you, the business clients, to get an accurate portrayal of a specific business category. And third, like we do today, to gather experts together who can fill in the gaps and provide their expertise on what's going on with current trends. And we certainly have a lot to talk about today. So we will be doing those things today. But before we do, I'd like to ask that you all help and join me in thanking our event underwriters, Bank of Marin, Gelati Construction, and the Marin Healthcare District. We'd also like to extend a special thank you to our major sponsors, Gelati Brothers Construction and Kaiser. And lastly, a special thank you to the Marin Economic Forum, the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce, and the Marin Builders Association. Before we go further, let's clean up a few nuts and bolts. If you would like to or need to use closed captioning services, please click on live, the transcript icon at the bottom of the screen, and then click the hide the subtitle. And to everyone, we'd love to have your questions for our presenters today. You can post them at any time under Q&A prompt, under Zoom, and we will ask the questions at the end of each speaker's presentation. As I mentioned, we are grateful to have a longtime underwriter for this Impact Marin Conference in Bank of Marin. But we're especially honored today because we have joining with us Russ Colombo, the president and CEO of Bank of Marin. Russ is a lifelong resident of Marin County. The, he and the bank support events like this and others in the community because that's the kind of bank they are. They and their employees at 24 locations and seven Bay Area counties are all about what's best for the community. And so today I'd like to welcome Russ to this event. Good morning, Russ. Good morning, Anthony. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that you and your families are all doing well after a most challenging year. While Impact Marin had to be canceled in March of 2020 due to the onset of COVID-19, we're very pleased to be back as a sponsor one year later. I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of the North Bay Business Journal team in producing this timely and informative program about the state of the Marin business community. As an essential business, Bank of Marin has remained open to serve our customers throughout the pandemic. We will continue to find ways to help ease the financial burdens that everyone is facing. To all the small business owners who work tirelessly despite so many obstacles, to continue to support the needs of the community, we are truly grateful. With the pandemic's one year milestone behind us and more and more people getting vaccinated every single day, this is a good time to check on, in on those local businesses. Along with the COVID-19 update, today's speakers will be addressing how commercial real estate, retail businesses and economic development have all been impacted by the pandemic and how they are surviving. There's a lot to cover, so let's begin our program. Our first speaker is Dr. David Klein, CEO of Marin Health. Dr. Klein spent the first 14 years of his career working as a general surgeon. After leaving the operating room, he built a long, successful career as a healthcare executive and hospital CEO. Prior to his position at Marin Health Medical Center, he served as president and CEO of Dignity Health two San Francisco-based hospitals, St. Francis Memorial Hospital and St. Mary's Medical Center. Before joining Dignity Health, Dr. Klein was Chief Operating Officer and then President of the Baylor Scott and White Health All Saints Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Prior to that, he served as Administrator 
of Presbyterian Hospital in, in Denton, in Denton, Texas, and as a chief executive officer of Cedar Park Regional Medical Center in Austin, Texas. Dr. Klein received his bachelor's degree from the University of Southern California, his medical degree from the University of New Mexico, and his master's degree in business administration from the University of California at Irvine. Currently, he is the chair of the San Francisco section of the Hospital Council of Northern and Central California and a member of the San Francisco Medical Society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Klein. Great, Russ, thank you for that, that nice introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. And thanks to the North Bay Business Journal for including me on the panel. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, leading uh, Marin Health uh, through this pandemic and during this pandemic has been an experience I don't think any of us ever expected. And what I'd like to do uh, in the few moments that I have is share some of the details about where we are with COVID, the vaccine process, and, and, and maybe give you just a few insights into uh, how the country feels about uh, what's going on as we seem to be uh, coming out on the other end of uh, the pandemic. So I'm going to share my screen here. So uh, we uh, recently uh, got a copy of a survey that was done by a group uh, called PRC, which is a healthcare survey organization uh, that does national surveys. We actually at the hospital have used a lot of their data, but I came across this in the last couple of days and thought there were some really interesting findings. This survey was done uh, in February, just, uh, just a month ago. And um, interesting to find out that 22% of all households include healthcare workers or first responders. Uh, and as we looked across all the people that were surveyed, about 34% uh, of all people have actually personally been tested for COVID. Uh, there are a number of people, 12% that don't believe that they can get a test, which uh, I would, when I come to a slide later, you'll see that the tests are now finally widely available. And in fact, as we need less and less tests, more and more tests are available. And then uh, interestingly enough, about 40% of all Americans have been able to work primarily from home since the beginning of the pandemic, many of which are going to uh, continue uh, to work from home. When we look at the number of folks that say they'll get a vaccine, about 69% or, or really 70% uh, say they'll get a vaccine. But interestingly enough, uh, those that were asked if the vaccine was immediately available, would they get it? And only 50% said they'd get it. So 70% say they will get it, but not everybody wants to do that immediately. And I think that's a, uh, that's a, a common thing that we're seeing uh, across our areas that there's still a little bit reluctance uh, in uh, some folks to uh, uh, get vaccinated. There, uh, when we look at households, 37% uh, of uh, Americans that were surveyed said that they observed ex uh, extreme strict uh, recommendations for social distancing and masking, but 54% of all households have somebody at risk. So only 37% are following strict guidelines in households where over 50% uh, actually have uh, the uh, have concerns with, uh, with the elderly and, and sick folks that uh, are at much greater risk. Since the pandemic began, and this may ring true with a lot of you, people are exercising less, they're eating more bad foods, I know I am, uh, drinking more alcohol, smoking more, uh, and we see, you've heard of the COVID-10, the 10 pounds that most people put on during COVID. You also have heard how alcohol sales have been off the roof, I can tell you in the emergency room, we're seeing a number uh, of more patients that have alcohol-related uh, conditions and uh, some mental health conditions as well. And so I think that the pandemic has weighed heavily uh, on our population in uh, a number of different ways. And this is a slide that speaks to mental health issues and concerns and some of the things that we're seeing, uh, many uh, folks feel like they've gotten worse uh, from a mental health standpoint, uh, would seek uh, uh, care uh, when available. In fact, on the far side, you see 60, uh, nearly 68% would likely talk with a mental health professional about how the pandemic has affected them. 40% uh, of Americans are, are feeling lonely. Uh, they're feeling left out. They have lack of companionship. So the, so the, COVID, the COVID toll uh, has uh, manifested itself in many ways, but uh, mental health is one where we're seeing a really uh, a, a significant impact. And then Zoom, uh, we're on a Zoom call today. Uh, 50, almost 53% of all Americans are now using a, a video platform, Zoom, FaceTime, uh, in, outside of the work. They are using that for ways to connect with their friends and their families. And I think uh, it's opened up a whole new avenue of communication. I think we'll see that, to, that continue, as well as telehealth. 
uh, by in, our, in uh, March of last year, only 33% had tried telemedicine for the first time, and 80, uh, 81% are likely to use that going forward. So it is a platform that's here to stay. It has proved usefulness. In fact, some people won't see doctors unless they have telehealth visits. And lastly, when we talk about the economic realities, uh, more than a third of our country uh, did not go to see medical appointments when they had them because they were concerned about the possibility of contracting COVID, and that really impacted uh, the hospital as well as many other uh, businesses. And we also saw that there was an increase in conditions and an increase in number of deaths that occurred in the home uh, because people were quite honestly afraid to leave their homes and go out. So uh, I think the, the numbers bear out that a lot of people uh, suffered at home and did not seek medical care because of their concerns about the virus. So quick cartoon about, uh, you know, we had, we struggled with capacity for patients uh, with hospital beds, medical supplies, and at home, we struggled with capacity for patients with everything going on. And I think this is, this uh, probably rings true to many of you uh, with, uh, they've had, uh, you know, people sheltering home and your families. And uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a trying year. It's been an uh, interesting year for just about everybody. Our response at Marin Health was, was, uh, was I believe, quite effective uh, and quite efficient. And I want to maybe just take a, a quick moment to uh, thank all of our frontline healthcare workers and all frontline workers in general for uh, their un unbelievable and incredible heroism during this pandemic, particularly in the beginning when nobody knew what to expect. Uh, our staff put their, themselves at, at harm's way, uh, at risk, not knowing uh, what the consequences would be to care for the public and the community uh, that we have the privilege to serve. And I, I just have to say the acts of heroism that I saw uh, in first leading the Dignity Organization and then coming to Marin Health were uh, heartwarming and, and breathtaking and really uh, uh, remarkable. We did see a huge outpouring of love and, and thanks and gratitude from our communities as well uh, in support, whether it was food that was brought in and, and other things that were done, but it was really, uh, really an amazing time for healthcare workers to to, to really see what, what it is that they do. So our response, although it was efficient, was costly. You can see a list of things that we uh, needed to do uh, in uh, response to the COVID pandemic, surge preparation, different uh, the personal protective equipment, which was not inexpensive and acquiring it was difficulty, the testing costs, et cetera. And if you look on the right, uh, uh, Marin Health uh, alone lost over the year of the pandemic, lost uh, over $43 million in revenue. And we had an increase in $14 million in just COVID related costs. A little bit of that has been restored with CARES funding. We're hoping to have some FEMA funding to offset some of that 14 million. So far that's not happened, but we are hopeful that we'll get some reimbursement, but it has left most businesses in every hospital uh, in a financially precarious position. So moving forward, we're really focused on uh, climbing out of the financial hole, making sure that we care for our community, but, and also being uh, good custodians of our resources, reducing our expenses, building growth opportunities, restoring consumer confidence, and also most importantly, preparing for any possible future way, which, uh, uh, which I think we're very well prepared for. This time we'll be proactive and not reactive. And I think we'll see a much uh, better response if, if indeed we do see another wave. When we look at the numbers in Marin County, these are uh, fairly up to date as of 322. I think you may have seen these. Uh, these are publicly available uh, uh, numbers that are on the uh, Department of Public Health website and the county websites. Uh, over 11,000 total cases uh, through the pandemic were seen in Marin, 153 in the last 14 days, which is really a significant drop, uh, 348 hospitalizations, uh, nearly 400,000 total tests completed, uh, very sadly, 175 total deaths. Uh, one death is too many, 175 is, is absolutely devastating. And, uh, and I'll talk more about this, over 100,000 residents have now had at least one vaccine, uh, which equates to more than 50% of the county residents have received at least one vaccine. And I've, I've got a slide on the vaccination here in just a sec. This is a graph of, of the daily cases in Marin over time. And uh, you can see it, uh, picture's worth a thousand words. You can see how the numbers have come down. We peaked uh, after the Christmas holidays uh, in early January. And since that time, that was about the same time we started to have vaccine administration in institution. And you can see how tremendously the number of total cases have gone down. The solid line is a, is a seven day rolling average and each, each and every day, it goes down a little bit further. Oops, I got it. Let me try this one more time. 
This slide is one of my favorite slides, and I think one of the most interesting. Uh, when you look at Marin County, uh, when we look at the long-term uh, care facilities, which were the first to get the vaccinations right about the same time that health workers, frontline health workers were getting it, you can see the unbelievable uh, di diminishment. I call it a cliff. So if you see the active cases from December 14th through about January 25th, and you can see on the top when the first dose of the vaccine was given and when the second doses were given, uh, by the conclusion of the second dose is you see a precipitous drop in the number of cases. And we're seeing that in the hospital. Uh, and this is so critically important because I think you know that uh, patients over 70 contribute to at least 80% of all the deaths that were encountered uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic. And so uh, to be able to get those folks vaccinated in a timely fashion has been uh, just a remarkable achievement. When you look at uh, the vaccination rate by county, you can be very proud to know that Marin leads the state by, by a long ways uh, in number of doses given to 100,000 uh, total population. In fact, uh, I was talked to Dr. Willis yesterday. He says that that, that, that gap is even stretching further. Uh, we've done a great job. The county's done a good job. All of the partners, Sutter Kaiser, Marin Health, uh, uh, everybody has worked together uh, to make sure that we're vaccinating uh, our county. And it, and it really, uh, it's really been, uh, you know, truly uh, remarkable. As of yesterday, I think everybody saw the news. We entered into the orange or moderate tier. That was exciting news that allowed more businesses to reopen with, uh, with appropriate modifications. And uh, I think you guys have probably read this or seen this on the news. Gyms are going to be open, museums, zoos, and aquariums. Restaurants uh, can uh, hold up now to 50% uh, capacity. Uh, bars with no food can open outdoors. 100% uh, of Marin schools are open in some capacity. And it's believed that really by the end of the school year, all kids will have the ability to be back in school. And they have adopted the recent CDC rulings that three feet social distance is adequate. So that's going well. And then the last bullet point is one that I think is very interesting, and that is uh, 10 times more people are being vaccinated uh, than a um, uh, number of new cases uh, each day. So when we look at the testing, these are Marin Health numbers. Uh, we have only had one COVID patient in our hospital. It's been the same patient now for about two weeks. We have not had any more than that. That is the lowest number obviously we've seen since we had the first patient. Uh, to date at Marin Health, we've had a total of 354 patients. Uh, total babies delivered to COVID mothers uh, have been 25. And uh, sadly, we've had 18 deaths at uh, Marin Health Medical Center uh, through the pandemic with, uh, unfortunately, the last one was just a couple of, a uh, couple of days ago. Testing is no longer an issue. Uh, I know that uh, we were talking on a call, a COVID task force call yesterday that for the longest time, we uh, all we talked about was testing and how we get people in testing. Now we've got plenty of tests. We have three different options at Marin Health uh, and plenty of capacity. Anybody that wants to get a test can get a test. And that goes for all the community resources uh, for testing. We have different platforms that have different capacity uh, and take different durations. I won't uh, go into a lot of detail on that. Our vaccination program, I think, has been exemplary. Uh, I think that uh, Marin has led uh, the region and how well we do the vaccine rollout, as is uh, proven by the numbers that we've done. Uh, there were a lot of issues with vaccine supply early on, and I know there was a lot of frustration uh, from patients uh, with any entity trying to find a place to get the vaccine. Uh, but the supply, the supply differences uh, led to some of that. Marin Health was supplied by the County Public Health Department. Uh, Kaiser, Sutter, and UCSF are all what are called multi-county entities. So they had their vaccines distributed through different uh, different organizations uh, from the uh, from the state, and so there was some disparity of who got what and when they got it. And uh, I think that has all kind of calmed down now a little bit. We started our employee vaccine program in mid December, completed that by the first of February, and vaccinated over 2,700 individuals. That's about 80 percent of our employees and staff uh, that were immunized. We began our patient patient vaccination program uh, in mid-January, uh, and that has continued even today, and I'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, where that's being transferred to. Uh, all we've done so far is Moderna and Pfizer vaccines for all the vaccines that have been done in Marin Health, and we've had really very few, very few, if any, adverse events. So they've been very, very mild. This is a, a graph, a pie graph of uh, the vaccines given. We've given out over 6,000. The vast majority have been to uh, our community. Uh, and some to our providers and to uh, our employees.
And we opened our outside clinic in uh, our old medical center emergency room. I think everybody knows we have the new Oak Pavilion. And uh, with the new emergency room and the old emergency room, we created a COVID clinic there. Uh, to date, uh, well, through the 18th, we vaccinated over 3,000 patients. Again, the main limitation has been the vaccine distribution channels. And we've had plenty of slots and plenty of personnel. We just haven't always had vaccine. And uh, at times, it's proved frustrating to all of you and to the community. Uh, but I think we're over that hump, and the distribution channels seem to be more uh, solidified. I just want to say 30 seconds worth of thanks also to all of our incredible volunteers uh, who have led, helped lead this effort, uh, from physicians to community members to all of our staff. People have stepped up in a great way to help the vaccine. And it's very rewarding. Lots of gratitude. Have never seen so many wonderful letters from patients of gratitude. And all this is because of the strong collaboration that we've had in our system. Things are changing a little bit. I think now uh, you've seen and know that uh, Blue Shield will be taking over the state vaccine allocation. Uh, Marin has done it so well. We're, we're, I would say that uh, I think Dr. Willis would also say we're dragging our feet a little bit because things are, are going so well and we want them to get the bugs out. But I think for registration purposes, this is the way you register for a vaccine. I think for scheduling, that's the second part of my term and just sort of keep in contact uh, with the websites. And if you have registered, uh, uh, I would work through uh, the county uh, areas to see uh, when your term will come up. But I think we're advising everybody to register through my turn. Uh, our on-site clinic will effectively close on the 29th and we will be joining the county uh, civic center pod, uh, which will be capable of doing between 3,500 and 4,000 vaccines a day. Uh, and I think the numbers are really impressive uh, in that, uh, as I said, we've done over half the people, 80% uh, of those over 75 have received a vaccine, 75% of those over 65 have received vaccine. I saw numbers yesterday, uh, and again, this changes every day, that we only need another 54 days to vaccinate everybody in Marin that wants to have a vaccine. So that takes us to about mid-May when it's highly likely that those that want a vaccine will all be vaccinated. So stay tuned for the tiers to be opened up a little bit more and to allow people to get their vaccines. We're also going to vaccinate our discharged uh, patients uh, before they go home and also anybody that we've missed uh, on our staff. This is just one, one token. Uh, you can see through the paper, it was a big box of seized candy, which I probably ate every piece of it. But our community has been so gracious and so loving and so caring and taking care of our staff uh, through thick and through thin. And, and we, we are appreciative of the community and the support uh, that we have received. Very quickly on variants and boosters, and then I'll wrap it up. I think that this is the big news. Uh, is the variants. There's really three main variants that have been discovered and reported in the United States. The biggest one is the British variant. That's the one you see the 4,500, I'm sorry, 4,700 cases that have been reported. If you look at the heat map on the bottom, California is in the light blue, uh, which means we have between 300 and about 450 of the British variant. I don't, I'm not sure. I, I could be wrong that we've seen any of the other two variants in the state of California, but we are testing for variants and keeping our eyes on on that situation. So as we see variants or mutation, mutations, they do affect the pandemic in a couple of ways. I think you probably have heard that they might increase transmissibility. Uh, it's still not clear whether uh, severity of illness is impacted by these variants or whether protection from having had a previous COVID infection will still protect you. Uh, the response to vaccines are important. Will, they, will the vaccine still be responsive to the new variants? And what about the testing? We think there's a diminished response to some of the monoclonal antibody testing, and we're coming up with new ways and combined therapy to treat uh, these folks. Um, it appears that several vaccines may sat have satisfying immunity towards these variants. Most vaccines, and most importantly, most vaccines will very likely provide excellent protection against hospitalization deaths uh, from these variants. And that's really a, quite important uh, because that's really what we're trying to protect is the sickness and the people that end up hospitalized. And then booster, booster vaccines are now being uh, developed and we think they'll be highly effective. This, pro I think, is my last slide. Uh, when we look at the vaccines and the variants, uh, we would expect that there will be an increasing number of cases in younger unvaccinated population uh, because they're unvaccinating. But uh, what's important as these cases rise, we believe that the risk for hospital surge and death will decrease significantly. That's a healthy population. They typically don't get very sick. They uh, unusually require hospitalization. Uh, and uh, as we vaccinated all those that are at the highest risk for hospitalization, uh, and death, we think we'll see the hospital numbers continue to stay low. Uh, the tier restrictions in California need to follow suit. Those were all predicated originally by a number of hospital beds and vacancies and surge capacity 
ventilators, ICU beds. But as we see more cases that aren't severe and don't require hospitalization, uh, I would see that we'll see relaxation of the tiers uh, and the things that get opened up. And then, as I said, the death rate from COVID uh, will fall, uh, uh, has fallen, will fall significantly due to all the vaccines that we're doing. So we're really making progress. I think it's something we're going to be hard to. And then lastly, California had 26% increase uh, in all deaths over the past year. So I'm going to jump out of the screen now and come back over. And I know that's a lot of information in a short period of time, but I hope that's a nice overview of sort of where we are with, uh, with COVID uh, these days. Thank you so much, David. And if you want to indulge me for a moment, I have a few questions for you. Okay. But before that, uh, Russ Colombo, you did an excellent job of introducing David, but I gave myself a big fat zero because I failed to introduce myself at the start of the presentation. I'm Anthony Borders, the uh, event content manager and editor of the North Bay Business Journal. So welcome everybody again, and I'm sorry for not introducing myself. David, I promise to get back on the treadmill when I get home today, given your remarks, but can you tell me uh, between mental health and physical health or something else, what do you think will be the longest lasting health impact uh, on the community of the COVID crisis? Yeah, I think it's going to be the mental health uh, situation. Uh, we're seeing uh, as each day goes on, even as we start to climb out of the, the pandemic and they start to open up the community, just an uh, overabundance of, of folks that are suffering from uh, mental health uh, concerns and also substance use uh, concerns. I think that's going to be long going. There's been uh, a lot of damage uh, that's been done uh, uh, not only from the fear, but just from being uh, socially isolated. I think we're seeing a big uh, increase in adolescents in particular, in youth, uh, in uh, mental health uh, concerns and depression and anxiety and some of these other things. Uh, because, you know, the kids were really impacted too. They were taken out of their normal social environment. So that, that I think will far outstrip uh, the other consequences. And one more question for you. I know your chart showed this quite dramatically. The um, fiscal change in the situation of Marin Healthcare District as a result of the cost of COVID and the decline in revenues. How long lasting will that fiscal reversal be? And do you see it have any long-term effects? You know, I do. Uh, it's really going to be predicated by how quickly the volume starts to come back uh, into the hospital. Uh, I will tell you, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen our largest volume of ER patients that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. We're starting to see an increase in our hospitalizations uh, as well as our surgeries. So uh, it's going to uh, it's going to take a couple of years, I believe, really to climb out financially from uh, some of the, the things that uh, the hospitals, uh, uh, the, well, the impact that the hospitals had. And we're not alone. I think uh, probably. Every Every hospital in the country has a similar story, but uh, it's going to take quite a while. Thank you so much for that. And David, thank you and Marin Healthcare District. I think we're, we're blessed to have both of you guiding us through this uh, wonderful time we call COVID. But thank you for joining us. Today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Hayden Nangaro. He joined Newmark in 2010 and is currently the executive managing director and market leader of the company's office in San Rafael. Now, over a 34 year career, Hayden has been involved in some of the largest uh, retail commercial real estate transactions in the area. But today he's going to update us on something more current, the current status of the commercial real estate market in the North Bay, given the COVID crisis and some other details about the current trends in real estate. So good morning, Hayden. Good morning. I'm going to <clears throat> share my screen here. So one second. Okay. So uh, this is a view from San Francisco looking into Marin. And in my career, we have been waiting for companies to kind of consider Marin as an option when they think of uh, different models for their space. And yeah, we're starting to see that. Today, what I'm going to discuss is where we stand kind of end of first quarter, uh, what's it look like when we return from the office, some office market trends. Uh, we're seeing a shift in some inventory as people look to uh, reposition buildings, change of use, and what is going to happen moving forward. So 
The key indicators right now are pretty consistent from what we've seen pre-pandemic. We have about an 18% vacancy rate in the county. Um, our Class A asking rents have held pretty solid. So overall, uh, we talk about prices per square foot on a full service basis. And Marin, our rents are about $3.61 overall. Uh, when you go Larks per South, uh, between 490 and 550 a foot. So those are high, relatively high rental rates for you know my 30 plus year career here in Marin. These are still strong asking rates where deals actually shake out. What actually happens when somebody negotiates a deal is to be determined. Our sale prices average about $395 a foot and we're seeing a slight increase in sales activity. So a quick snapshot, um, we're not seeing a lot of new inventory that's going to hit the market. Most of the development in our county is now confined to build a suit. Biomarin, for example, is going to be building some buildings, but a lot of the office supply that we anticipated is considering change of use uh, to residential and to other uses. Uh, the subly space in our market hasn't been as dramatic as what we've seen in San Francisco. Right now in San Francisco, there's 9 million square feet of sublease space, which is a huge amount. There is a lot of thought that some of that sublease space will be reabsorbed. So companies are putting space out, see if there's a taker. As people go back to work, rather than take a discount, they may just reoccupy the space. Uh, last year was the slowest year uh, ever as far as office sales transactions. We only recorded 28 million in office sales uh, versus 417 million the previous year. So just a huge decrease, uh, very tough for both buyers to figure out what is pricing or price, is pricing gonna decrease? Lenders have a hard time deciding what to lend on, are values going up or down? So. We just saw stagnation in the sale uh, category last year, expecting that to pick up this year. So what does return from work look like? Uh, there was a presentation a few weeks ago by Jim Wonderman with the Bay Area Council. They uh, did a big survey and you know, talked about basically three models. One is a lot of press on the hub and spoke model. So you have a small headquarters, maybe it's in San Francisco, but you wanna put clusters of small satellite offices where the employees live. So you're not gonna ask the Marin resident to commute into San Francisco, you're gonna establish a satellite office in Marin or in Walnut Creek or some other area. Uh, the second model is decentralized. That's uh, a small headquarters again, a lot of workers working from home or remotely. Uh, what we're hearing from executives, though, is that although CEOs are saying, yes, you can work from Montana, I'm a skier, so let's say I want to move to Jackson Hole. Okay, you can go to Jackson Hole, but that doesn't mean your pay is going to be the same. Uh, we may pay you less because you're not living here, and we also may not promote you the same way. If somebody is here in our headquarters and working hard and you're remote, uh, that could factor into um, promotion. So there's there's still a lot of debate as to how uh, how much legs this work from home concept has. Uh, I think a lot of people feel like there's advantages to getting back to work, and over time, CEOs will start pushing for that. Uh, the third model is kind of pre-pandemic. Everyone's back to office. So if you look at the chart above, you can see that the the first two uh, models uh, are the majority of, of what we're going to see coming forward. More people looking for satellite offices, allowing work from home. So what are some trends? Uh, if you're going to come back to work, we're going to want to create a more, I say, homey feel. What, what does that mean? Well, when you if somebody is working from home and maybe coming into to the office two to three days a week versus five days a week, why are they coming to work? They're coming to work to collaborate. So they're gonna to wanna to get into team rooms and work on projects together, interact. So we're seeing uh, people space planning 
to account for more conference rooms. So there's a theory that density will decrease as people work from home. Uh, there's also a converse uh, thought that the density will actually increase uh, or the, the square footage per person will increase because we're gonna have more collaborative space, more conference rooms. So uh, we talk about square foot per person. When I started, we talked about 200 square feet per person. For a law firm, maybe 250 square feet per person. Over time, with open seating, bench seating, like a WeWork environment where you just plug in and sit at a desk, densities were getting down below 150 square feet per person, in some cases 100 square feet per person. Uh, architects we've been talking to are suggesting that dense see that square foot per person is going to go back to 200 square feet per person. Um, you know, that's just uh, on an average. So what are people looking for? Uh, a lot of studies, this ties into the Marin Health presentation about uh, a healthy work environment. And, you know, we all picked uh, working and living in Marin because it's a, a healthy environment. We have a lot of nice outside space, but that's gonna be even in more demand. So there's studies about the impact of natural daylight, uh, having a lot of glass in open area, operable windows to get fresh air into the building. Uh, offices are working on filtration systems to make the offices safer. Uh, there's a huge emphasis to outdoor space, and that was uh, starting pre-pandemic, but what we're seeing is those outside areas will be more than just creating a sunshade or a bocce ball court, but they're going to actually electrify the outside area. So you can go outside, plug in your laptop, work from outside. Uh, we've seen examples of outside conference room, glass conference rooms where people can go outside, be in an enclosed environment and work from outdoors. So that you know, speaks well to the Marin County suburban office style where we have uh, a lot of outside area. Uh, you know, if you're in San Francisco, it's difficult to create those outside areas in, in the same way. Short-term public transportation, there's going to be some hesitation to jump on, say, BART or uh, public transportation. So the fact that in Marin, we've got a lot of uh, free parking, and if people are driving, you know, one of the big uh, problems with us trying to attract companies from outside Marin is twofold. One is uh, lack of affordable housing, and we see some good news there. And the second is lack of uh, public transportation. So with the uh, development of SMART going to the Larkspur Ferry, people can take the Larkspur Ferry, jump on SMART, and get to a lot of our office buildings. Uh, it's going to take a while before people are comfortable jumping in an elevator. Uh, so the fact that most of our buildings are two and three stories, they have open stairwells to go up and down, uh, that's an advantage. Walking and amenities are very important. So as companies leave an urban setting and consider a suburban setting, they're going to say, well, you know, what we don't want to give up is being able to walk and get you know, a good cup of coffee to have a good meal. So uh, that is a good sign for some of our downtown areas that have been hit hard with the pandemic. If people are gonna come back to work, they're gonna want quality space. So if you're gonna ask me to leave my home and come back and come to the office, well, the space better be special. So uh, there is uh, a flight to quality, if you will. So people are looking for nicer space that uh, meet some of the criteria I mentioned before, where you've got daylight, you've got decks, you have views, uh, you feel like it's more of a, a, a home environment than going to a sterile office building. You know, there's uh, a lot of talk about uh, what's been lost working from home. It's very hard to create culture when you're not face-to-face -face with people. Uh, we hear from law firms, if you're a junior law partner and you want to get promoted, how do you do that remotely? How do you learn if you're not around others in a similar situation, hearing what people are doing? How do they conduct business? So uh, for those reasons, we see, you know, back to work, uh, heading that direction with the increase in vaccines. So some of the trends 
uh, in our market. Some of these things occurred before, but some of our major buildings are really focusing on outside area. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing some proposed changes of use. Uh, Fireman's Fund, uh, you know, it was a beautiful campus built for Fireman's Fund, big floor plates, uh, but really didn't speak to the Marin market. Uh, it was designed for a large company to take on the whole building. It didn't break up well. So that's been on our inventory for quite a while. And you know, discussions are now that that may be mixed use, uh, provide some needed residential. The Northgate Mall is talking about doing some residential. Mm -hmm. So again, these are good factors uh, on a couple levels. One is uh, if you're an office building owner, uh, there's not going to be a lot of new office inventory. Number two, uh, trying to recruit or keep uh, your employees here when there isn't any available housing. There's new housing stock on the way, finally. So again, people are looking for a healthy work environment. A couple of examples at Hamilton Landing, they had proposed a 52,000 foot office building that would look like one of the hangars you see in the picture. And the new ownership there said, you know, we're not gonna build more office. What we're gonna do is create outside space. We're gonna have a dog park. We're gonna have sun shades. We're gonna create an area where you could play live music, really engage this like a, a, a campus that you'd see in other markets. Wood Hollow, we did a deal uh, with uh, Birkenstock and Birkenstock, one of the executives wanted a putting green. And so the ownership said, sure, we'll give you a putting green so that uh, you can't quite see it, but uh, just north of the bocce ball is a putting green, there's outside seating. Uh, and so that's the type of space people are looking for. Another project, 4000 Civic Center, uh, where Marin Health is, uh, coincidentally, they created a light well to get some more light as you enter the first floor. And in that little donut area, the previous tenant was actually conducting yoga classes outside. So they'd run yoga during the day. Uh, this ownership spent a million dollars, a million three actually, creating some nice outside space that overlooks the Northgate Mall, updating the lobbies, uh, knowing the tenants are you know, striving towards quality. Um, here's the Fireman's Fund campus. It is proposed to go more mixed use. Uh, Northgate Mall talking about doing more uh, residential, which could be a nice play. You know, there's reciprocal parking uh, advantages to having residential in a retail setting. The residents go to work and uh, leave and the office or retail tenants can then use parking during the day. So it's a nice, uh, a nice solution for the Northgate Mall. So what do we see going forward? Uh, office market remains stable. Lease rates are holding and to be specific, I'm talking about asking lease rates where deals actually are made uh, remains to be seen. We see the suburban office being more desirable as companies consider a hub and spoke model. I brought a, a agent from our San Francisco office out to Hamilton. And the first thing this gentleman said was, wow, you know, before you go to Utah or Texas, you know, why not leave San Francisco for Novato? And I think we're gonna see more of that as companies think about this hub and spoke model, uh, considering a suburban building that has outside space, that has walkable uh, amenities where you can get up and down the building without taking an elevator. So in Marin, we are seeing owners that continue to uh, improve their buildings. Uh, that was nice to see even during a pandemic where there was very little lease activity. Owners were investing in their properties uh, in preparation for a changing market. So we're seeing conversion of commercial space, not only Fireman's Fund potentially, uh, the Northgate Mall. There's been a number of uh, changes of use. I, I sit in downtown Santa Fe. An office building next door to me is now under construction for a hotel. Uh, we sold a office building in Sausalito that's going to apartments. So uh, again, we need housing and, and that uh, housing stock is going to increase, which is a good sign. Uh, we are seeing more companies from outside Marin looking at Marin as an option. And if you look at the makeup of our market, 
you know, we have we have industries that have done well during the pandemic. So games companies are, are doing it extremely well. Uh, we have 2K, we've got Activision, we've got Epic Games, all doing very well. Companies that have strong presences here that uh, likely will grow. We've always had a very strong technology sec sector here, uh, the auto desks of the world. Life science uh, and healthcare. We've got great healthcare here with Marin Health and Sutter and Kaiser, strong presence. And, uh, you know, we're seeing that healthcare shift, not just to a hospital, but more into an office environment. So uh, as they do more of a hub and spoke model, as you will, uh, some of the office space will be absorbed by healthcare. You know, we're fortunate to have one of the most successful companies uh, in the nation right now, Ultragenics, that's done extremely well and Biomarin as, as drivers in our market. And then we've always had a strong financial services uh, industry. So money management firms uh, have, have done well and are recognized as a hub uh, throughout the country in areas like Larkspur projects there, Wood Island, Drake's Landing have always had strong financial service uh, representation. Our banks, uh, like Bank of Marin and others, uh, have a strong presence. So we are well positioned to, to come out of this uh, as the vaccines increase. If people now feel safer to come to work, when they come to work, we, uh, you know, our feeling is the Marin market is well suited to, to capture activity. And with that, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hayden. I appreciate your time today and uh, your insight into the wide variety of trends that we can be expected to experience in the next few months or years, perhaps, in the commercial real estate business. I, I did have one question from the audience. Uh, the question is this. How much uh, do you see Class B uh, real estate being upgraded to Class A in this pandemic? Is there much to do of that and will it be a factor? I think there's gonna be a, a, a demand to convert class B buildings. I think class B buildings, if they don't invest are gonna get left behind. What we see is the tenants that are out aren't necessarily bargain hunters. Uh, some of the strongest demand we have are in the buildings that charge the highest lease rates. So I do see class B owners needing to uh, invest in their buildings and create a better work environment. So the answer is yes, I do see that. Great. Hayden, thank you for your insight today. Uh, we have a lot to think about based on your presentation and I'm sure you'll be back with us, updating us on some of these trends that stick around uh, throughout the next year or so. But thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, next, we will shift gears, friends, to a, uh, a different topic, but one I think you can't really doubt has been a major player in all of our lives throughout this COVID situation. If you do, if you live anywhere in our North Bay, you know how much small business has been affected by the COVID virus and how much it has changed the landscape of doing businesses, doing business as a small business person. Perhaps this is no more and more evident than in Marin County, where a large share of the businesses have 10 or fewer employees, so have been greatly affected by this, uh, this crisis we call COVID. Today, we have a new, unique opportunity to learn a little bit more about how that business community is coping with COVID. Joanne Webster is president and CEO of the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce. She has years of experience beyond that as a sole proprietor and then director of the San Rafael Business Improvement District. She's active in the organization Keep Marin Working, but today she'll also share with us recent results of a survey done of small businesses in the area to learn how they are coping with the crisis. So please join me in welcoming Joanne. Thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you for inviting me to participate this morning. This is such an important event in Marin County, and I'm delighted to be here. This morning, I'm going to share the results of a recent countywide survey on the financial impacts of COVID-19 on our local businesses. 
This survey was created and executed by Keep Marin Working, a collaboration of leading business associations in Marin. Using SurveyMonkey, the survey was emailed out to newsletters and posted on websites and in social media channels with the help from cities, the county, and other chambers. The survey was available for three weeks in February and a total of nearly 1,200 surveys were completed, which captures 10% of the total licenses countywide. And as you will see, there was a fair distribution sample of small, medium, and large businesses representing every major business sector. It should be noted that although we translated the survey in Spanish, distribution of the survey to our Spanish-speaking businesses proved to be more complex, and that was due to digital literacy and the digital divide that exists in Marin. We acknowledge that more work needs to be done to reach both Latino and BIPOC owned businesses, and we will continue to work with our community partners to capture and track this data. However, we believe the survey is a strong start as it represents a wide, variety, a wide array of businesses across Marin. The goal of the survey was to help us understand the financial stability and financial needs of our local businesses to better support them moving forward. We knew that chambers and cities were sending out their own surveys and tracking closures, but we didn't have this information through a county-wide lens that was easy to share. As noted, it was a good mix of industries. Notice the green bar to the right, which is the other category. And after carefully reviewing the write-ins, we did determined that most of these would actually fit into the, all of the choices very equally, but the respondents wanted to, to be very specific. However, two categories will be added to the next survey. One is cannabis, and the other one that should be added is event planners and event venues. As I said, the mix of survey respondents is a reflection of the business mix in Marin. 67% of the respondents were from San Rafael, 8% from Novato, 6% from unincorporated Marin, 5% from Mill Valley, and the remainder from every other local jurisdiction. Thanks to our partners from the county, the cities, and our local chambers, we had a solid representation across the county. 70% of these businesses that partic participated have been in operation for over 10 years. 74% had five or less employees and 92% had less than 20. 44% were single owner businesses. Again, a really good representation of the actual size of the businesses in our county. We are truly made up of smaller employers. When we asked them about the current status of their business, 38% reported that they were open and they're working in their original location. However, many of them that said as they would remain open, the owners were not collecting a salary. 32% reported they were partially open with reduced staff and a majority of the others that actually filled out the other category said that they were in a hybrid model as you heard Hayden say, they were adopting a model where half were remote and half were working from their office. And as those who were working from that office, um, or I'm sorry, um, those some of those actually gave up their office space and they were working from home. And those that reported working from home were actually saying they were having success with meeting their clients virtually. When asked about their revenues since the shelter in place, it was staggering that 78% reported a decline in the revenues and 36% saw a dra drastic decrease in their revenues, anywhere between 50 and 100%. When we asked them about what their plans were for the next three to six months, 17 businesses said they had permanently closed and 32 additional businesses said they had planned on closing for good in the near future. Nearly 50% said they will remain in business with the same number of staff, and 16% said they will remain in business with reduced staff. Even though a majority of the businesses said that they would remain open with their staff, they were still expressing massive uncertainty about the future. They, were, they reported things like, I'll stay open as long as I can, Maybe I'll close, maybe I'll let my employees go. They were really trying to hang in there, but what we could tell is they were running on a runway. 
and in an effort to assess what kind of funding they received and who received funding, were absolutely shocked to discover that 58% were using personal savings, accumulating credit card debt, or using family loans just to keep them in operation. That was a real pain point. Over 50%, as you can see from the left-hand side, did say they received a first PPP, but only 14% received a second one. And what we heard from the Small Business Development Center is that even if businesses did receive funding, it only covered a portion of their losses. Something else that we found really worrisome was the right-hand bar, which was the other category, because 42% of those in the other category reported that they did not receive any funding, they didn't use any additional funds, and 14% were using unemployment assistance. So we feel a much deeper dive is needed into why those that did not receive funding or any additional um, revenues. And we wanna ask the question, was it because they weren't eligible? Did they apply and they were denied? They did, just did not have the financial documentation needed or perhaps they just didn't need it. So we're sharing our data with the Dominican University Borowski School of Business. They have offered to do a deeper dive and perform additional analysis on that. When asked what kind of funding they needed for the next six months, we were surprised that 25% reported that they only need $5,000 or less to keep them operational for another six months. And another 25% said they need between 20,000 and 50,000 to sustain their business. So it makes sense. And when we asked them what their biggest challenge was moving forward, 70% stated financial security and economic sustainability. These businesses are at a critical juncture and many need a boost and a vote of confidence so that they can move forward. Certainly we have um, the possibility of a drought this summer, which is gonna incur restaurants to have other and food service businesses to have additional costs. We may face more power interruptions. We may have excessive heat and with restaurants operating outdoors, that could be a challenge. And we certainly don't know what the variants are in California and Europe. I do wanna state that some additional questions were added after the survey was made public. And one of them was about women owned businesses. So the 66% reported is not a reflection of all of the respondents. However, we do know that there is a trend for women owned businesses currently growing faster than all businesses over the last five years. And we know that women have been adversely impacted by the pandemic. So in conclusion, businesses in Marin County have been affected dramatically by the COVID-19 pandemic, and they went to great lengths to survive. Over 76% reported declines in revenue, 36% reported drastic declines in revenue, and they named financial security as the biggest challenge. But the most alarming fact was that 58% of our local businesses are using personal savings credit card debt and family loans for a means to stay operational. And this is simply not sustainable. The Cape Marin Working Group is strongly recommending another countywide business relief grant program. We suggest a program up to $2 million that would drive a quicker recovery. And we suggest exploring a longer term commitment to recover the affected industries. The life but of the lifeblood of Marin's economy is in the retention and expansion of our small businesses. As we have witnessed, many of our local businesses are adapting and embracing the changes in our environment, but they are taking on more debt. Uncertainty is still a factor and it's our concern that these businesses simply cannot take on any more debt. If our businesses do not invest in their operations, grow in the coming years, it will slow down or even shut down our Marin economy. And before I take questions, I would like first to thank my colleagues at Keep Marin Working, the North Bay Leadership Council, Marin Realtors Association, Marin Economic Forum, the Marin Builders Association, the Hispanic Chamber, the San Rafael Chamber, my colleagues at the Novato Chamber, the Latino Council, the Marin Small Business Development Center and Canal Alliance. And I'd like to give a shout out to Josh Townsend at Strategic 32 for creating and executing this survey. Joanne, thank you so much for a detailed, very specific and helpful uh, deep dive into the 
status of the small business community, not in just, in just Marin, obviously, but um, I think it would transfer to other places in the North Bay. So when you use phrases like uh, sh uh, short uh, runway and uh, high number of people who are tapping their own personal funds to keep their businesses alive, I guess that's point to the question, which is not to be uh, uh, flip about it, but how long is the runway? How long can businesses go on like this um, if things don't change in the next month or is it the next six months where we'll see some real significant long lasting damage? Yes, and I appreciate that question, Anthony. And I wanna thank the, the journal for actually having a positive news story this week. It's really great to, you know, to, to read some good news, um, but we can't ignore the survey. There are a number of them that are still suffering. And um, we've identified a few sectors of uh, business groups that actually are not eligible for these state and federal funds. And one of them is um, the businesses that opened in 2020 or in very late 2019. Um, and they, you know, uh, invested hundreds of thousands of dollars to get launched, but then we went into shelter in place. But because they weren't in existence for 12 months or more, they weren't eligible for funds. So I think the runway is relatively short, certainly for those that have been impacted the most. Thank you so much. And again, I appreciate the work you do and the groups you work with are trying to get the information out to the public and to policymakers who need to hear this. And understand what's going on on the small town streets that we all uh, depend on. So thank you very much. Thank Julia. you. Uh, let me remind you, if you have any questions for our speakers, to put them in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get them answered as we go through our program. But we are lucky enough to do today to have someone who can perhaps provide some answers on where we go from here in terms of helping out small businesses. Danielle O'Leary is the director of economic development and innovation for the city of San Rafael. She's not only worked at that post, but similar posts on economic developments in cities such as Santa Rosa, Los Gatos, San Juan Capistrano, and Palm Desert. Today, my friend, she's joined us to talk about how some programs, what some programs are that might be helping out small businesses and keeping them going. Good morning, Danielle. Good morning, thank you for having me here today and for the great panel that has preceded me. All this information has been wonderful, uh, very interesting. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for uh, having me here today, everybody in Zoom land. Thank you for joining us today. Today, I'm gonna touch on um, small business resources and share with you some stories of uh, the recovery work we're doing in San Rafael and Marin. Just a quick hello who I am. I'm the Director of Economic Development and Innovation for the City of San Rafael. I've been working in economic development for over 20 years and have um, experience in small to mid-sized cities. And today what I'm gonna be talking about is doing a quick status check-in on small businesses in Marin. I have some data that I've pulled uh, talking about trusted sources and knowing your options. Uh, discussing know when to say I need help because I think that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned is knowing when to bring in reinforcements and technical expertise to help you navigate. And then a snapshot of San Rafael's pandemic response. You can kind of see um, some examples and then Q&A if there is any. So, to start, I thought it would be interesting to know, uh, this was done uh, back in August, so the data isn't the most current here, but that Yelp data has shown that 60% of the business closures nationwide are, are permanent. And when you think about that, that's just like a devastating number. Um, a lot of people have indicated that uh, their closures were permanent and that they wouldn't be opening. So when you think about the impact to small business nationwide, it is, a, is it a jolt and, and shock that, you know, I've certainly never seen and lived through and I don't think many have. There's a great uh, resource that uh, is available nationwide. You can uh, dive down into it by county, state, uh, metro area called Opportunity Insights. And what I pulled for you today is just um, some data that shows you during the course of the pandemic, you can kind of get a sense 
for the, the big undulations we were experiencing. Um, this is reflective of the change of the number of small businesses that were open. And you can see here in the early beginning of January and then boom, right before April, this little uh, graduation cap signifies when public schools were, were closed. And you just see a very drastic increase. And as you move along the chart, these little house uh, icons here are when we started to um, phase in the different reopenings. So there was a, a stay at home, shelter in place order. And then we slowly started trying to claw our way back to some normalcy and open. And you can see during the first area, we started to climb back up and then boom, these little X's signify when we had to re-shut down uh, because we see a surge in cases. And you can follow that all the way back up. You see, uh, you know, during between October and December, we make good headway of being almost back to where we were. And then boom, we're back down again at, after the second wave of closures. And so as of February, you know, within the Marin County area, you know, we're, we're looking at a negative 38.4% in small business openings, which is significant. And Marin is primarily made up of small businesses change in revenue. This was another snapshot. Um, in total, you know, we've seen almost a 36% decrease in revenue as of February, but it was much more drastic in the beginning of the pandemic. Again, you notice when the public schools are closed, we move into the reopening phases, back to closures. You can also see when stimulus payments start and so you, you again see the undulations that small businesses are, are having to navigate and communities are having to navigate. And then lastly, for the data I'd like to share is around the percentage change in consumer spending. And you know this is really the customer pulling back, the businesses talking and speaking to the lack of demand and lack of transaction power. And you see in the early stages, again, the, the uh, graph follows what we've seen before, a sharp decrease. But interestingly enough, we're back up here now at a negative you know, 5.9%. To me, reading this, that is a lot more positive than I anticipated for February. So I think things are starting uh, to stabilize somewhat on the consumer spending and demand uh, front. So that's great news for our local businesses. I would like to share uh, a little uh, story quickly of a local business owner and to um, Joanne Webster's point from San Rafael Chamber. Here was a business owner who spent a year uh, creating a, uh, it was a co-working studio for, for women. And she opened the first day of the shelter in place and it was devastating for her. Uh, her name's Tiffany. If you'd like to hear more about her story, you can visit lifeinsanrafael.com. And we did a podcast interview with her talking about what it was like to navigate trying to open your business during a pandemic. And so I share these stories with you because it's a, it's a lot to take in for a small business owner. And if there's one thing I can communicate to the group, what's most important is to understand you cannot do this alone that you need to be able to connect with trusted sources on information to help you navigate this ongoing pandemic. What we've noticed is it's two steps forward, two steps back. Information is changing, it's changing rapidly. And what we hear from a lot of small business owners is it's overwhelming. They don't know where to look. They uh, become quickly overwhelmed with the amount of information choices they have. And so I put together just a, a small slide, and this is a fraction of trusted sources that I certainly have relied on uh, during the pandemic. Uh, you know, your, your city or town will be putting out information as it relates to closures and small business programs. Um, in Marin County, there was an effort led by the county that's still going on called Marin Recovers that brought different industry groups together to talk about reopening and helping businesses meet the uh, requirements for reopening under the pandemic orders. The County of Marin continues to put out consistent and reliable information as well as our uh, San Rafael Chamber, our Downtown Business Improvement District, Marin Economic Forum, 
you've got the Small Business Development Council not only putting out information, but also offering technical assistance. North Bay Business Journal, Marin IJ, San Francisco Chronicle, Canal Alliance, North Bay Leadership, all of these are just a snapshot of resources as a small business you can go to to stay connected with what's happening in, in the pandemic space, the reopening space, and what uh, you know tools are there for you to utilize. Another area is your industry trade group. So if you're in the retail association, the restaurant association, staying at that broader state level to hear about the advocacy that's going on in your space or specific programs that are geared toward your industry. Another area that I also find really dynamic and up to date and I find easy to take in and digest during the day is through social media. So many of these organizations are on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And so you can get that information, follow something, bookmark a page. If you can't get to it, come back to it when you have time to look through what information is out there to help you uh, reopen your business, get access to funding, understand the reopening statuses and what is required of you as a small business. Know when to call for help. So in the early days of the pandemic, our office, uh, along with I know the chamber and county offices received an overwhelming amount of calls, questions, concerns, trying to understand what programs were available and how they might access them. A few of them are the PPP, many people refer to, which is the payroll protection plan. This was a federal program that came out of uh, the coronavirus uh, stimulus the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, the California Small Business Grant, all of these require some sort of technical assistance, whether that's uh, help from your tax preparer to get the needed documents for submittal, whether it's understanding how to access the loan portal and upload your information. And that's where we found partnering with the Sonoma um, or the Small Business Development Council, both in the North, there's two North Bay locations, one in Sonoma and one in Marin, that helped sit down biz with businesses individually and go through their applications, which was, which was huge in the early days because it was very confusing. Our local banks, Bank of Marin, uh, for example, was great with our existing business community and having them walk through the applications. There's lots of questions, tax implications, understanding you know, what, what resources cover what. And in the first stages of the PPP, we had about 394 San Rafael businesses receive loans through that program. And countywide, it was around 1,066. If it weren't for our local banks, we would really have struggled to get this kind of money out into the community and helping businesses navigate and survive. Also, social media and marketing support. As a business, you're trying to navigate staying open, employee safety, communicating with your customers, but a lot of the customers are also starving to, for information. What are your hours? How do I interact with you? What kind of products can I still buy? And that's where that social media and marketing support, whether it's provided by someone on your team or you hire um, an independent contractor to provide that for you, that also helps continue to keep you out in the public eye. And then lastly, we have a new round of federal stimulus that we're all still trying to get our arms around. Um, but one of the things we are hearing is that they're gonna be restaurant grants. So as the pandemic continues, we're starting to see more nuanced programs for industries that have really been impacted. Tourism is also another one that has taken quite a hit during the pandemic. So just a little bit on what we are um, dealing with here in San Rafael, some things we did in the, in the immediate was right when the pandemic hit, we realized that cash flow and businesses just struggling to hang on and stay open was important. We partnered with the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce, the County of Marin, the BID and the city and put together a local disaster relief grant program. We also created a business support portal on the city's website that logged in all of the different programs that were available to our local businesses so that they could have quick, easy access to navigate and research what was important to them. We also worked with the County of Marin and the Marin Recovers effort to develop site protection protocols which were basically the instructions for how a business owner would reopen, what was required of them as far as distancing, plexiglass, hand wipes, um, you know, 
hand sanitizer, all of those things, public health signage. It was a lot for a small business owner to take in. And so we created a tool that was basically a template. A business owner could download it, quickly understand what was needed, post it up in their place of business, and the customer knew they were compliant and they could self-certify. In addition to that, San Rafael also offered supportive client uh, compliance visits with our businesses just to make sure they had any questions, that they understood what was needed of them in order to remain open and safe. And then we also, you know, tried to work on understanding how to leverage the various um, state and federal programs, the PPP, the EIDL, they, they interact with each other and there's some um, consequences if you take one over the other. So trying to get our arms around that and understand what that is. The community development block grant, um, coronavirus funds were one of the first ways that communities receive federal funding to support um, you know, the community. And one of the earliest programs was rental assistance for our community. We also partnered with the county on Great Plates, which uh, partnered restaurants with senior meals. And during the early stages of the pandemic, if you can remember back to that graph where I showed you that drastic decline, this was a great program to create and stimulate some demand. And then we also worked to uh, reopen and provide regulatory relief and programming. So, you know, in the early days, we needed to account for curbside pickup, especially in our downtown. So working with our parking team and creating those um, designated curbside areas, parklets for outdoor dining. And we also, uh, I would say we, we put together uh, a dining under the lights program and partnership with the business improvement district who really led this effort to shut down our streets on uh, Thursday and Friday nights to allow diners and uh, to dine under our lights and eat safely outside and get our business and restaurants getting some of that transactions that they were missing from being fully open indoors. Ongoing support and where we are now, we are in a transition and we have been uh, looking at ways that we can help provide relief wherever we can. We have a temporary banner fee waivers for businesses announcing openings. We've got a business license tax waiver one to two months We've got parklet transition, so helping our businesses in the early days move from just you know basic barricades into something more semi-permanent and beautiful for uh, guests and their customers to utilize. We're going through the second round of PPP, EIDL, and uh, Great Prates programs. So those are successful in the first round. They're they're now doing that again. Some have expired, but some are still in process. And then programming, another round of dining under the lights and a farmer's market that will hopefully um, bring people to our downtown, keep them connected to our downtown. And then lastly, uh, we've got uh, our mayor, Mayor, mayor Kate Collin, uh, created a walkabout outreach program to uh, physically go walk the various districts, commercial districts in our downtown and connect with businesses to one, introduce tell her she's there and she cares and to really talk with them and encourage them to, to fill out the business survey that the Keep Marin Working Group is working on. And with that, I will conclude and I just wanna thank everybody for having me here today and allowing me to present. But then Danielle, we thank you for being part of our program today. Uh, if, if the rulers have to be monitored uh, provided by yourself, my plan has been uh, extraordinary. extraordinary. I, would I would encourage small business owners and more and more based business to post the video of this presentation or the slideshows. Go on those slideshows and look at the information provided. There are some solid answers. I'm sure to some of the questions small business owners are asking. Thank you. 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 As the leader and co founder of the Raider Office, a small, specially coffee roasting company in San Rafael. Under her leadership, the Raider has grown, has grown from a small roaster and has itself a large international brand, but it has done so without becoming untethered from its values. This is a company that is steeped in the values that it began with and continue to hold on to them. And they can go, but like they won't. Overnight, 
and uh, it, it, we were lucky enough to have a lesson that kind of had on that one. There were those lessons that we were talking about. How, how about uh, how, how lessons that a virus has been learned that quick difficulties, what others can take from well, welcome home. Thank you very much, Anthony. And thank you to North Bay Business Times for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, you know, what you said earlier, Anthony, about the North Bay Business Journal giving us accurate information, great data and experts. We've seen that with the folks that we've just had present, which has been uh, wonderful to hear everybody. I want to start with Dr. Klein. When you think about what Equator has done is we're working towards getting everyone vaccinated. Hayden talked about, you know, commercial real estate. And here we are with 12 landlords. Uh, Equator currently has, and we have our new headquarters in San, San Anselmo and our roasting plant in uh, San Rafael, which we've been in uh, 26 years. And then we talk a little bit about, Joanne, what you mentioned. Um, we are, we fall into that category of 50% of our business was cut in half. And Danielle, finally, all the resources that, um, you know, Impact Marine has brought to bear has been super helpful for small businesses like Equator. So I want to thank everybody for that. Um, I want to take everybody back, uh, even though we're so happy to be here where we are right now, but take it back a year ago, especially with Equator, I mean, we are, we've been in business for 26 years. We are a, a mid-sized company, but back in January, 2020, it was all blue skies, right? We, uh, we had 160 employees. We had eight retail stores, over 400 wholesale customers. We we're roasting in New York. We we're roasting coffee in LA, and of course, roasting in San Rafael. And then overnight, two weeks before, you know, the governor had asked us to shut down, we had shut down our stores the weekend before and to really get an assessment of where we were with COVID and just, you know, we're all in a state of shock about it. Um, so, you know, I've learned a lot of things in the last 12 months. And I think the most important thing that we've been talking about here and what Equator has learned is that, you know, immediately what we had to do as B Corp, we had to really, uh, with a 50% decline, think about all the wholesale customers that we had. We were shipping a thousand pounds to Google, pounds to LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitch, Slack. 45% uh, of our business was wholesale and 50% of that business started working from home. So our revenues for 2020, the forecast were cut in half. So when things like that happen, uh, fortunately for us, we've been in business for 26 years and we have a very good uh, uh, balance sheet and we have a very good partner with Bank of Moran to help us sort of navigate all these issues. But we immediately had to you know, conserve cash, right? And how do you survive and not let uh, let go of the values of the company. And that was like the number one uh, thing that we thought about right out of the gate with my leadership team. It's like, look, we need to um, really, you know, uh, we have to lay off employees, unfortunately. We have to take uh, salary reductions, but we cannot, you know, lose the values of the company. And think about, you know, we're buying coffee from our farmers that depend on us. We're buying our milk from, you know, farmers that we have here in Sonoma County. So we cannot, you know, we cannot go backwards. We have to go forward. And that was the, um, that was the edict that I put out there that let's move forward. Let's figure this thing out. This is a black swan event. And if we work together on this, um, we will come out the other side. So. Um, there are some green shoots right now in terms of where Equator is, but right out of the gate, you know, in order to survive, we had to conserve cash and we had to do it very, very quickly, right? That, that's the most important thing. So we had to get with leadership, we have uh, an incredible HR department, and we basically had to eliminate the entire wholesale team because that's where uh, the revenues fell out of. So um, we helped them all with a very, very soft landing. I worked very closely with them. We extended their benefits, uh, their pay in order to get them uh, to the other side of this. But those early months were very, very difficult. And there were a lot of conversations and there were a lot of sleepless nights. And I'm sure everybody on this call and everybody that's listening um, can, can relate to that for sure. Um, and then the next thing was, luckily for us, um, we were in the process of, um, you know, beta testing a, a technology app. And we had seen so much with Starbucks with their mobile app that our customers wanted to have some sort of access to us on a mobile type basis. And, you know, thankfully, we're in the process of doing that. So when we shut down for two weeks to kind of regroup and to communicate with our team and our customers, uh, we opened, we reopened six of our eight stores, two of our stores, one we gave up, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the Tenderloin 986 market, we had to leave that store. Our LinkedIn store in San Francisco, those folks won't be back till the end of the summer. So we're able to open six of our stores with that app. And thankfully, I want to thank all of our customers who are on this call and all the trust that our employees, um, you know, showed in us as a B Corp, where we really work so hard to put people first and ahead of profits. Um, and of course, when there's no revenue coming in, it's it's a very uh, it's a very difficult uh, challenge to really, you know, put that, keep that flag in the ground and make sure that you're marching forward. So we opened with uh, the new technology, which was the app, and we were able to have a frictionless, uh, cash-free, credit card-free environment. So that was that was super important to getting us back on our feet and getting our stores open. Um, you know, obviously with the commercial real estate, you know, all of our, you know, we have this beautiful space in San Rafael, I'm sure you've seen it, EQHQ and our entire marketing finance, uh, HR team is working from home. So we have an empty space there. Um, and again, with the commercial real estate, it's great to see what Hayden said that, um, you know, folks are going to, you know, we know they're going to come back to work. I've been quizzing all my tech companies. They say the end of the end of summer, uh, some are saying the end of fall, we have a new coffee bar going on the Microsoft campus. Um, and that was supposed to be fourth quarter. That's now looking like third quarter. Um, so things keep getting pushed out. It's all based on sort of how fast we can get vaccinated and how fast we can stay out in front of these variants. Um, so having the technology of the app was uh, something that really saved us uh, on that side. And then, you know, being an omni-channel business, I mean, Brooke and I started the company in 1995, 26 years ago, and we were primarily wholesale, uh, selling to folks like Thomas Keller Restaurant Group and Rustic Bakeries of the World and the tech companies of the world. And eight years ago, thankfully, uh, we opened up our first retail store at Tam Junction, and we grew to eight retail stores. So having uh, diversified revenue streams is really, really important, and it's been so important during COVID to be able to um, have ch one channel turns off and not to be able to just completely um, close the company down, but to be able to keep people working uh, at our roastery, obviously six feet apart, uh, skeleton shifts, a lot of rescheduling uh, to get people to feel safe, to continue to pack coffee. Um, so having an omni-channel business, which you know was wholesale, retail, grocery, uh, and digital, but then flipping it really to really leaning in heavily on the digital channel and really leaning in heavy on the retail channel and, and grocery, uh, reaching out to every grocery store to get our coffee on the shelf. So imagine we go from these big five pound bags, you know, a thousand pounds when we go to Google to all these little small little 12 ounce bags just to keep the team going. And then we also, um, you know, we really try to figure out on the technology side, you know, how do we communicate with our customers? So how do we take Helen, which is me, in front of our stores telling our story and bring that online? So we learned so much about Instagram Live. And then we, you know, the marketing team um, uh, worked with getting 12 ambassadors for us. So now we have these, what we call a tiger collective, where we have 12 individuals, they're musicians, artists, um, athletes, and we're doing Instagram Live. Uh, watching Patty O'Leary run up Mount Tam and they come down to Mill Valley and then have a cup of coffee. And then we're doing Instagram Live with our LinkedIn customers and Slack uh, customers with people working from home. So the pivoting that went on in the first six months of COVID um, it just made all of our head spin, completely made our head spin. But we were able, we were able to do it for sure. And then, you know, the communication, the communication with your, with your customers, right? So they trust that, you know, you are, you know, following all the COVID protocols, the communication and trust with our own employees. We just opened up the lobby today at our, at our Proof Lab uh, coffee shop. Prior to that, we weren't letting anybody into the lobby. So um, that was the first step today. We also took that step in our Fort Mason store. And that tells us a lot about the trust that our employees have for us and the communication that we've been able to share with them in terms of what we're doing on the leadership team and the ownership team to make sure everybody stays safe and all those protocols are followed. Um, and of course, we, you know, we're so lucky because we did get the PPP loan. We got the first loan and um, how lucky were we to get that PPP loan and how lucky were we to have the guidance of, you know, uh, Bank of Iran and the folks that are on board there to help us through this. I mean, we're a mid-sized company. We're not a small mom and pop. When I think about the folks, you know, you know, we, we closed 
for two weeks. You know, mom and pops that had to be there so they could pay their rent were open. You know, the Starbucks of the world being tr publicly traded were open. But as a B Corp and as a small business, we had to close down to really assess where we were with COVID and what the protocols that we needed to put in place to make sure that our, our staff and our customers felt safe. And then we started to open up since then. We went from having the app, we still have the app, to then taking credit cards and then rearranging the entire inside lobbies and then taking, then taking cash and then wrestling with some folks in some of the locations about wearing masks and you know, really helping our team work through you know, all those issue, issues. And then the whole, you know, the killing of George Floyd. So all these things happening during COVID and all the pivoting that Equator had to, had to do to make sure our team felt safe, make sure that they felt listened to, to communicate to our customers. That was all really, really important to us. Um, and finally, you know, the expectations of leadership. You know, we're still on payroll reductions. Um, we're still working towards hiring folks back. Um, you know, when your company in 2020 with a forecast that is absolutely cut in half and, you know, taking those hikes and wondering, you know, what's it gonna be like a year from now? Thankfully for us, we've been in business for 26 years. We're seasoned um, and we've got folks that that were just previous who are around the rim in Marin to give us all the resources and all the coaching that we need to put one foot in front of the other. So I see a lot of green shoots now. Um, we've got six stores reopened and we're seeing some of our um, wholesale business start to come back. And we're also um, doing super well on the digital side, getting weight, you know, a lot of customers throughout the country are ordering our coffee online, um, more grocery um, opportunities with Nugget Markets and Whole Foods and Olives and Andes and all those folks are bringing in our coffee. And uh, so it's really about, you know, the pivoting and having people on the leadership team to help you. So the things that we had to do was, you know, we had to conserve cash. And that's very, very difficult to do that overnight. We had to really rely on technology. And thankfully we were in the process of, you know, beta testing. And then sort of, you know, anybody who's listening who has a small business, you know, having diversified revenue streams is more important than ever now. Um, communication, right? How do you communicate with your customers when you can't be out in front of your store? How do you take your brand online to be able to communicate and tell a story that's positive? Um, and lets people know what you're doing behind the scenes and how important it is as a B Corp that we are not gonna cut any corners. We are gonna continue to buy great products. We're gonna continue to honor our green coffee contracts. We're gonna continue to make sure that our, you know, our, our employees feel whole and they feel valued um, because it's been a very, very emotional time and we're a multi-generational business. We have folks from 18 years old up to 60 years old in the company. And we have really, you know, when you think about being a B Corp, it's about using business as a force for good in the world. This has been using our business as really um, a coaching, um, you know, having a memorable experience that we're all in this together and that together we will get out the other side. So the expectation that I've had of leadership is for us all to lean in with less, uh, to know that we will build back and we will build back better. Um, and we will be back to 2020 revenues in, in two years and that we're getting on the other side of this thing. So I really just want to thank everybody, um, especially our customers for having, you know, the faith in us. I want to thank our bank. I want to thank our CEO, our board, all the folks that have really leaned in to help us get to the other side. But we are, we are a microcosm, Equator is, because of the size grown in Marin where we are in this epidemic, how we will exit this epidemic. You know, something about the pandemic that has provided to all small businesses, and that's clarity. You know, when you're, when you're riding high, you know, there's a lot of things that you kind of let go, right? Maybe you should look at that lease. Maybe you should think about that product line. You know, this pandemic has really provided an enormous uh, amount of clarity as, as a CEO of a, of a company that we've had for 26 years that we hope to have for another 26 years. And we will do that. 
uh, with the right leadership. So uh, I want to thank everybody for um, hanging out on the on the call here to the very end. And um, you know, none of this can be done alone. And we live in a great part of the world, which is uh, Northern California, where we have a lot of resources. But what Joanne, what you laid out is really where we're at, you know? Uh, the majority of folks have lost 50% of their businesses. So all I ask is the folks that are online with the restaurants that are opening up, be patient, be patient because we've had a lot, we've changed a lot. Now with the app and people coming up to the windows, you know, we could get 200 orders out of the gate in the morning and I'll read the Yelp reviews that says, oh, I had to wait 20 minutes for my coffee, I had to do this. All these things have, you know, added up. So we're all, you know, we're all able to sort of continue to grow. So, um, and then finally, I want to thank our, you know, I can't say enough about our healthcare workers and the frontline folks and the medical staff and it's just where we live in the best uh, part of the world here in Northern California, we have access to so many things. So I'm very, I'm feeling very grateful today uh, as we go forward and move out of the uh, pandemic. So thank you very much. Helen, thank you. Uh, we are so blessed to have you today and uh, sharing a boots on the ground kind of experience of what a business has gone through is a nice cap to this whole morning, but I appreciate your being willing to do that. That's helpful to everyone in our business community to hear these kinds of stories and know that there is, there are ways out, that there are ways to get through it. So I thank you again, Helen. Sure. And please join me once again in thanking for this morning's presentation, our events underwriters, Bank of Marin, Gelati Construction, and the Marin Healthcare District. And also for bringing this event to us today, our major sponsors, Gelati Brothers Construction and Kaiser uh, Permanente. And we would also like to thank our sp special uh, participants, the Marin Economic Forum, the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce and the Marin Builders Association. When we began this journey this morning, friends, I mentioned that our mission at the North Bay Business Journal was to provide accurate, current, and we hope comprehensive and helpful information about how to make your business decisions, which are getting tougher every day. Please tell us how we're doing on that effort. Contact me, editor and content manager, Anthony Borders, anytime and let us know. And the journal throughout this year will be as committed to providing a special year of recognition and conferences. So don't forget to sign up for our next virtual event, the always popular online celebration of the journal's 40 under 40 winners on April 24th. Thanks again for being on the journey and we'll talk later.